This is just the beginning. Hello, and welcome to Axios' virtual event, The Future of Healthcare. I'm Sam Baker. I'm the healthcare editor at Axios, coming to you today from my home in Washington, D.C. I want to thank United Health Group for making this conversation possible. And I want to welcome our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Axios.com. Please do join the conversation on Twitter. Use the hashtag Axios Events and follow at Axios. Over the next 30 minutes, we will unpack how new technology is disrupting the healthcare system, changing the way people receive care day to day, uh, and the tools that providers use to manage their patients' health. Our first guest today is Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, also joining us from Washington, where it is finally spring. Senator, thank you so much for being with us on this beautiful day. Thank you, Sam. Good to be with you, man. Uh, so just to, to kick things off here, you know, when we talk about, about health technology, that can encompass a lot. I think the piece of it that is probably uh, most visible to the average American would be the, the explosion in smart devices like the, the Fitbit, the Apple Watch, things like that, that, that you know, track your steps, can, can monitor your heart rate, that sort of thing. I know you have some concerns with the, the privacy of the data that those devices collect, the potential for misuse of that data. Can you give us a, a status update here on, on what you're working on in that department? Yeah, we have legislation that would require the information gathered from smartwatches to be treated as if it were protected health information. Certainly not to be used without your permission on anything that would otherwise underwrite your eligibility for fill in a product. One example, um, um, as people as men age, they tend to have problems, their prostate enlarges, happens to every man. If you're waking up four or five times at night to urinate and your watch is monitoring you, and you could kind of figure out how the watch would be interpreted for that, that could indicate that you've got more problems with benign prostatic hypertrophy than would be expected for someone your age. Ah, the insurance company would say, that's expensive. We're going to have to pay for medications or surgery or something. We're not sure we want to insure that person. Conversely, imagine somebody in their searches is constantly looking for information regarding HIV or diabetes. Well, somebody who is a headhunter could glean that information from your searches. And when they go to present you to an employer, say, we've done an analysis of searches. It appears that this person is interested in HIV or diabetes. That may mean they have it. There are implications for the cost for your health insurance, your group health insurance plan, if this is true. I mean, it doesn't take just just a little bit of thinking about the implications of this surveillance state that we invite by wearing a watch or doing our searches, knowing that's being monitored, that begin to indicate pretty clearly we should be concerned about the privacy. I'm curious how you sort of think these things through generally at a, at a 30,000 foot uh, level, you know, a lot of health tech is is new. Maybe we're still figuring out its exact potential. You don't want to sort of kill it in the crib with overregulation. On the other hand, a lot of it is very powerful technology, and you don't want to let it run so far amok that all of a sudden, you know, as you just alluded to, people have lost you know any control or autonomy over their own their own data or their own health. Uh, so I'm just sort of curious. You know, you are a doctor. You are a, a conservative. Uh, as you sort of look at this field, what do you feel is the, the sort of the, the appropriate role for regulation as all of this there, develops? One, you got to get your facts together and you have to know the implications and you have to know the potential solutions. Uh, so once you put those together, you know a path forward. Uh, for example, if I use my credit card to buy um, a medicine, um, let's pick something to buy a book on managing, uh, pick a disease, um, uh, diabetes again. Um, well, that credit card history is sold within seconds or minutes to a data aggregator who can then make that available to a company like Amazon 
to help construct a profile of who I am. We should not allow that. Or I should have the ability to block my data from being sold. Okay, so that's, we know the facts, we know what's happening now, we know the potential, we have a solution before us. But let's look at something different, where there's a tension, not just between somebody's profit at the expense of my privacy, but the, but the tension between medical advances in which my privacy needs to be guarded, but we need the use of this aggregate big data in order to achieve the medical advance. There's a doctor I've been speaking with up in Boston, a fellow named Ken Mandel. And Ken tells me you can have a data lake. And in the data lake, everybody's data is put into the lake. It's anonymized. You can extract a data set from the lake, but it cannot be re-identified. In that case, we've resolved the tension. Okay, my data is being used in aggregate with much other data. It will be used for artificial intelligence analysis to point a way forward for a tough medical condition, but it cannot be de-anonymized de de to connect it once more with me. Those are the sorts of fact-finding, both of what are the issues, what are the potential good, potential bad, and a way forward that we need to do for a whole range of issues re re regarding technology and, and as you describe in this, in this conference. Do you, I mean, since, since you are a physician, you see the system, you know what its gaps are, you know what it takes to treat a patient, you know what would be helpful to you or extraneous to you. Do you feel like most of the, you know, sort of where the action is, where the money is in health tech, is it in the right place? Do you feel like there's value in what we're getting right now? Well, in a sense, we're at a time of incredible innovation the market will sort out where there's value. Uh, just the value. Today, I was uh, shot a video for a conference of, of gynecologists uh, and obstetricians. And imagine where we could have, and we have legislation promoting this, a woman who's at risk for preeclampsia, a condition in the third trimester of uh, pregnancy, could have uh, remote monitoring of her blood pressure at home with the results fed to the physician so that if her blood pressure began to rise, an intervention could take place. Particularly important for low-income patients who may have greater challenges getting rides to the office in order to have regular monitoring of blood pressure. What a potential to address a major public health issue and would actually save money for the taxpayer or for the insurer because you're monitoring somebody when, when she's at that risk. But I, but I do think, you know, for example, going back to the smartwatch, um, I don't know if somebody wearing that realizes, let's imagine it's an older person, that if they have Parkinson's disease, and they're beginning to walk in a very characteristic uh, way that Parkinson's patients have, or maybe to fall more often, that this could actually be put into a profile indicating that this person was at greater risk for Parkinson's. And so maybe we want to try and figure out how to boot them off our insurance plan. So uh, there is, but the flip side is, oh, they're starting to show signs of Parkinson's. Maybe we need to intervene. We need to make the incentive so it's the latter, not the former. How do we use it for good and not for evil? An age-old problem discussed in the Bible. In this case, we're trying to apply that discussion to medical technology. We are almost out of time. One, one quick question, uh, you know, one sort of, Silver lining is probably too strong of a term, but for lack of a better term, silver lining of this terrible year, this pandemic has been the surge in telemedicine. I know that's something that you uh, were, were happy to see happen. Obviously, wish it was under different circumstances. Want to see outlast the pandemic. Are you optimistic that it will? Yeah, I am. It's just shown to be so beneficial. My medical practice was with low-income patients, reliant upon public transportation, difficult to get to the doctor's office. Uh, you have mental illness, you have a hard time anyway. Now with telehealth, we're able to reach into the person's home or to a place nearby, 
non-threatening, where they can go for their visit. It has the potential to dramatically improve outcomes and lower expenses. That's the example of what can work. All right. Well, let's uh, leave it on a positive note then. Senator, thank you again so much for taking the time to be with us today and share your thoughts. It's always great to talk to you. Thank you, Sam. And up next, we have a View from the Top segment with Axios Senior Vice President John Otto. Thank you, Sam. I'm John Otto, Senior Vice President of Client Partnerships here at Axios. Uh, Now joining us from Eden Prairie, Minnesota, the Chief Physician Executive of Optum Labs and Executive Vice President of Research and Development at United Health Group, Dr. Deneen Voita. Hi, Deneen. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for joining today. Uh, So I'd like to start with some background on the organization. Can you tell our viewers a little more about United Health Group and Optum Labs? Sure. So United Health Group, um, we are 330,000 people strong, and we are committed to helping people live healthier lives and helping the health system work better for everybody. And we do that through three main units. First is United Health Care, our insurance companies, where we serve Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial. And then Optum on the, both the health services side and the direct delivery of care. Our R&D group is named Optum Labs, and we are about 850 people dedicated to creating the future of healthcare. And we do that through data scientists, clinicians, mathematicians, and we're all focused on the early detection and interception of disease. Now, the last year has redefined consumers' experiences with the healthcare system. Um, How has the pandemic impacted consumer behavior from your perspective? And what are some things you're doing in response to these needs? I'd say it it impacted them immensely, and um, particularly on how care is delivered, where care is delivered, and what is care, actually definitionally. And so I'd start by saying, using telehealth as an example. We actually partnered with Civic Science to look at the percent of people who actually used telehealth services in May of 2020, and it was actually about 30%. And if we compare that to December 2019, it was only about 8%. So we actually quickly, when we started seeing the telehealth numbers increase and the need for telehealth to continue, we modified a number of our policies and and worked with the provider community to make that happen. In addition, we also acknowledge though that people still need people and not everything can be done using technology and remotely. Fortunately, we were um, blessed with a service that had been around for a number of years called House Calls. We actually made 2 million house calls last year. So really enabling our advanced practice nurses to go into people's homes and meet their unmet needs, which is particularly critical during this pandemic because what we really saw, um, it was the interplay between health, finances, and social situations. And you really do learn a lot about people's social situations when you're in their home. Along those lines, modernizing the healthcare system has a whole host of public policy implications across all levels of government. Um, What are United Health Group's policy solutions to enhance the healthcare experience for consumers and providers? Yeah, starting with the providers. One thing that's clear, again, we have to make it easier for providers to do their job. And one opportunity is nationally to standardize the quality reporting. It's frankly just too difficult when you have multiple different requests from different entities. And if we could agree that we all want to promote evidence-based care and then actually derive a standardized quality reporting forms, it would make it a lot easier. I think on the patient side, we have to continue to um, allow financial and benefit incentives to help people help themselves. So we see that in our level two uh, diabetes business where we serve people living with type two diabetes with a number of both um, digital assets such as a continuous glucose monitor and benefit enhancements to allow people to manage their own care. Because if you think about it, when you're living with type two diabetes, it's a 24 seven job. Now, you know, looking ahead, there are plenty of learnings from the last year that'll shape the industry. Uh, I'd love to hear from you you a few major trends that we should expect for the future of healthcare. Really, what are you tracking right now? 
Yeah, one that um, I think will was, was highlighted during the pandemic is the disparities in care. And I think going forward, we will see a relentless focus to improving in this area. And we can do so by you thinking about our data assets and really understanding why, number one, there are such uh, disparities in care. But number two is training the next generation of data scientists. We know there are some inherent biases in all of us when we're delivering care, um, but they're also, say, when we're understanding, uh, when we look at data and what it means. And the best thing we can do, again, is to have a data science pool that looks like the rest of the country. Over the last years, we have actually invested in the Clinical Scholars Program, where we actually help fund a diverse um, workforce and direct delivery of care. And we turned that attention over the past year in a partnership with Morehouse to do the same thing for data scientists. Uh, such an important point to, to end on. Uh, Dr. Denine Boyta, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for having me. Uh, and thanks to uh, United Health Group for making this program possible. Now I'll pass it back to my colleague, Sam Baker. Our final guest is Ryan Penchot-Churam. Under President Obama, he served as the country's Deputy Chief Technology Officer, and more recently, he co-founded U.S. Digital Response, which is helping states and cities find their way out of the COVID pandemic. Ryan, thank you so much for being with us today. Always. Thanks for having me, Sam. Well, so let's start with, with what you're working on right now uh, with, with COVID response uh, and, and your organization, U.S. Digital Response. Can you just sort of lay out for us some of the technological or data problems that uh, states and cities and maybe the federal government ran into uh, and how you all are sort of helping them sort through all that? Yeah, of course. So uh, I'm one of the co-founders of a group called the United States Digital Response. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit that started about almost a year ago uh, at the start of the pandemic. Myself, Corey Zarek, Jen Polka, and Raylene Young got emails all at the same time from different state, federal, and local governments asking if technologists could lend a hand. I mean, I'm sure everyone here remembers what it was like a year ago when, you know, the entire response for the pandemic was pushed to states and local governments and they needed help. And so we were emailing the same uh, mailing lists and we decided, hey, what if we just actually join together, create an entity, an organization that can actually help channel people towards these kinds of opportunities. And so the incredible thing, it's been a year, we've worked with over 180 different governments at the federal, state and local levels about 250 projects, as well as you know, helping 13 million people across 36 states. Um, our volunteer core is what makes this special and possible. It's about 6,500 people everywhere from Silicon Valley to New York to everywhere in between. And um, the work there really led us to a set of problems. Right now, the team is working heavily with states and local governments on vaccine work. But really back in March, April, May of last year, it was on data specifically COVID pandemic data. And we were helping states with their dashboards, uh, cities with helping reporting how hospitals were doing on their ICU capacity. But we also noticed something more troubling, which was that the federal government wasn't sharing data on how states were doing at all, right? On key critical measures, tests, cases, hospitalizations. And so one of the spin out projects from the US digital response was this project called COVID exit strategy. We set out to track how all 50 states were doing on the pandemic and we you know, ranked them red, yellow, green. And we tried to show what metrics could be improved, how testing could be made better. And it really put a spotlight on how bad things were. And we tried to fill in this void along with a few other groups, COVID Act Now, the COVID Tracking Project, really to inform the public. We had millions of people come to our site. We had our uh, work cited in different places to help inform local communities. We did the work for pretty much a whole year, Sam, until the election happened, right? Up to then, we were really advocating for more data on the pandemic so people could know where COVID was spreading in their communities. And an election happens, and uh, all of a sudden in the November, December timeframe, which ended up happening, uh, started to see was that the government started releasing the information it had. And now you have an administration that's out there every single day with folks like Jeff Zients and Andy Slavitt and the current COVID-19 data director, Cyrus Shapar, who are putting data at the forefront and sharing it incredibly transparently with the public. So I know I shared a lot, but uh, it's uh, kind of a, a snap at the past year. 
Yes, I mean, it, I think it would be impossible to to get a situation like this under control without the kind of data you're talking about. We've also seen a lot of sort of tech uh, stumbles, for example, in the the vaccination appointment websites. I know you all are helping uh, some some states and cities sort of work through those kinks. Uh, you know, it, it seems like there were a lot of areas where where tech really was the answer. You know, that was clearly what we needed and eventually became the answer, but we sort of had a hard time getting there. Yeah, it's, it's you know, t- tech will always be a part of policy today, right? You know, anything that we want to get done, tech will probably be 10% or 15% of it. But I think what we got to focus on is always what are we trying to achieve, right? If we really want the uh, broader American public to react to public health, you know, messaging, we need to share data that supports it. For vaccinations, if we want to get 300 million people vaccinated by a certain date, how is tech going to play a role? How does the federal government help and assist state and local? Right now, it's still very much a every state, every local government for themselves. And so at U.S. Digital Response, we have templates, we have guides. You know, this isn't to discredit some of the work the federal government has done with, you know, a vaccine kind of starter site. But Honestly, that site itself could be could have been made so much better if it was really tested better, really put out, you know, in the field earlier for people to really give it a kick and actually try it. I mean, I think what we're going to see going forward always when it comes to new policies, new programs, what role will tech play? How can we execute upon it really well? Like those are the questions that I think we have to not only answer, but just get really good at. And when we're thinking specifically about uh, problems that, you know, within within the healthcare universe, uh, obviously it's it's not as if we had these beautiful, seamlessly flowing data systems, and then the pandemic came along, and oh, weird, they stopped working. You know, this is has obviously been a challenge throughout the system. Is that just sort of a, a result of how fragmented? the system overall is? Is it more of a technical failure? Can you just sort of give us your diagnosis because you've seen so much of it up close? I would say two parts. One part is, you know, the surveillance of pandemics, right? COVID pushed our entire health system to the brink, not just the like system itself, but also on the data side, right? You know, it does the old system, right? The way the CDC ran it does a great job to tell you if there's a problem there. But then when you need to start answering questions like, what hospitals need supplies, how many vaccines have been deployed, how many beds are being used. That's where the prior administration had to, you know, scramble and put together a new system called HHS Protect, which collects, you know, 200 data sets. They reach out to every hospital every single day, asking for 47 different categories of information. And they really, you know, uh, uh, I, I'd like to say, they, they really rise to the occasion, created a new system, and it actually proved to be really useful. My biggest critique for the prior administration is that they never shared the data publicly and uh, in, in, a, in a fashion which would help inform our communities, right? They produced this incredible report called the, the Task Force Report that they only shared with governors, but not everybody. And so, you know, from a data collection point of view, that's a challenge. And so I think when you think about how you fix the pandemic piece for the next one, Right. You know, we need to find ways for these systems to be more automated. Right. Like a hospital shouldn't have to fill this out every single day. How do you get it more seamlessly? So that's one thing. Right. These systems that are tracking how pandemics are spreading, how our hospitals are doing, they've got to be more automated. But on the other side, there's another big issue as well, too. You know, when when you think about the log jams in data and making sure data flowing in our healthcare system, the biggest log jam that there is, is the fact that we don't have a unique health patient identifier, right? And what I mean by a unique health patient identifier is to say that if there's a Sam Baker in California and one in New York, you know, how do I tell the difference between the two of them? You go to one hospital, that other person goes to another. How do I know who's who? And today, we really try to work around this problem by sharing lots of information and, you know, not just Sam Baker, but your name, your address, your phone number, and all of these different things to try to match, do this patient matching effort. You know, if we really want to see health data flow and for us to get the true value of all the dollars we've invested as the American people on EHRs, we really need to figure out how to create an ID, maybe, you know, a voluntary one 
that either the federal government or a group of entities on the outside create because you know we can't just keep relying on social security numbers being thrown around or all this other matching pieces we really got to fix this can it can it be fixed i mean to to your point we have so many different systems that are not used to talking to each other they're not really coordinated you know it's all sort of routed through through payers which have their own interests? I mean, is there a way out of this? You know, I, I think so. The, the way out of it is, is two parts. One, it's making sure these systems are open and as transparent as possible. There was a huge effort to, you know, really create APIs on all of the electronic health records. And there's a there's a, an effort called Fire that really enabled that. And like, that's why you can take your iPhone today and use HealthKit and really connect it to the hospital that you're at. So it's like making sure the data is flowing but you also got to make sure the data can be connected, right? Voluntarily, of course, that you can say that I want my data connected for truly a healthcare purpose. And I know it sounds as simple as this, but it's like a simple little number can really fix a lot of the things that are broken in our health system. You know, there was this report by Rand that came out that really was the reason why Congress and the federal government put all this money behind EHRs. It's because we would be able to coordinate care, catch you know, issues and medical records and things like that. But we left out the critical piece was, you know, for technology systems, you need ways to tie the data together. And, you know, I actually, I should also say though too, people are right in saying this is a privacy issue that should be looked at, but I think there are ways to work through it. And I really think the voluntary nature of it is really important. So, you know, just let's, let's take an example. If you and I don't want to have our records connected, that's fine. Don't pick, you know, don't use the unique ID. Just let them float the way that they're floating. But if you and I expect our health system to work on behalf of us, we can opt in and say, you know what, let's connect all these records together. You can use that ID for me. Just a, it's just an idea. Um, well, it, <laughs> as you said, it's just a simple little number. It sounds simple enough, but uh, of course, nothing ever is as simple as simple as it sounds, or maybe as simple as it could be. Um, well, let's leave it there, I think, on, you know, something to think about for the future. Uh, Ryan, thank you again so much for taking the time and, and sharing your expertise with us today. Really appreciate it. Always. Thanks for having me, Sam. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. And thank you again to our sponsor, United Health Group, for making this event possible. If you enjoyed this conversation, you will love Axios Vitals, our daily healthcare newsletter, which you can and should subscribe to at signup.axios.com or in the Axios app. Thank you again for joining us, and we will see you on axios.com.